you organise this meeting today on endocrine disruptors. Is it something that causes you concern? Yes, of course. Uh, it causes me concern and it causes not only to me, to many European citizens. It's clear that uh, we live in an era where man-made chemicals could interfere with the endocrine system. Uh, we are protected now against uh, chemicals, against pesticides, uh, which could harm human health in general. With uh, biocides regulation, pesticides, with rich, uh, we have the most uh, clear and uh, stringent legislation in the world. But now uh, it's time also to include uh, uh, a special category of endocrine disruptors. But we need to look at this uh, point with a lot of uh, uh, attention, uh, a lot of pragmatism, and to have a balanced and prudent approach. Not to cause uh, much harm uh, on, uh, in, in, on society, of course, and not to cause uh, more confusion than better regulation. And for this, we need uh, solid evidence. Uh, yesterday, the European Council, uh, the Environment Council, discussed uh, in any other business on the side uh, the issue of endocrine disruptors. Sweden and the Netherlands, and uh, I think it was also supported by Luxembourg, said that they wanted to take a precautionary approach rather than an evidence-based approach. Uh, what do you think of that initiative? Uh, it's just a uh, discussion, as I understood. It's not a final decision taken. We have now on the table uh, the three proposal of the European Commission of 5th of June, which are okay, even that I would desire to uh, look a little bit more closely on potency and time of exposure, because I think uh, they are crucial in order to uh, diagnose a substance as a endocrine disruptor. And also we'll wait in January or as soon as possible the uh, legislative text in order to look on it and uh, take, give an opinion on European Parliament. Uh, we'll see what the exact uh, text will be and we'll try to improve it. You're here today to talk about the Commission's new criteria on endocrine disruptors. We, we waited for this for a very long time. Firstly, what is an endocrine disruptor? An endocrine disruptor is something that interferes with your natural hormones to a sufficient extent and duration that it actually causes adverse effects like cancer, reproductive effects, changes in your immune system, and other effects like that. That sounds very scary. Are there many uh, endocrine disruptors in our current environment? Let's be clear of the difference between something that interferes with your hormones and something that causes sufficient change to cause disruption. We're continually exposed to things that change our hormone levels, and uh, that is a good thing. It's when it becomes excessive and prolonged that we start to worry about them. So most of the things we're eating, drinking, yes, there are hormonally active substances in them, but not sufficient that it's actually going to cause us problems. You've done some work on phthalates from the past. People are very scared about the impact of phthalates. What would you say about the phthalates at this moment? Have we got the regulation right? Well, I think the thing with phthalates is there are a lot of different ones and we can't generalize about all the phthalates. The issue is about what we call the short chain ones, that's the smaller ones, and uh, their endocrine disruptor properties. But there are a number of other phthalates, longer chain, that don't have the same properties at all. The Commission have come forward. It's taken them quite some time to come through uh, around with this uh, new criteria. Are you happy with the new criteria? I'm happy that they're developing. I think there's some more sophistication needed, but the general approach that we need to define them carefully and be clear of the difference between a qualitative effect, that's just anything that has a hormonal change, and a quantitative one, that's sufficient disruption that you get adverse effects. That's the key issue for us. You've spent many years working on risk and looking at things like the weight of evidence. What conclusions have you reached? Well, I think the the issue for hazard and risk assessment in the past has been that often our conclusions haven't been entirely clear to anybody who's not a scientist. So my view is we've got to develop a weight of evidence approach that's quantitative where we score everything. Anybody can follow what you've done and can see whether how you've reached your conclusions and agree with them or modify them according to their assessments. A sensitive issue in this building is always animal testing. 
must we do animal testing to assess the risk of some chemical? Well, unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have any way of assessing those adverse effects, uh, reproductive effects, cancer, changes in the immune system, without using animals. In the future, we may be able to do it, but it would be unreal of me to say that we can do it at the moment. So, what next? What would you like to see happen next? We have to work on a case-by-case -case basis. We have to develop a weight of evidence approach that's widely accepted and everybody can use, that will allow us to be consistent when we're judging a biocide or other chemicals for endocrine disruption. And we have to be very clear that endocrine changes are not the same as endocrine disruption. 